think we're going to get going again. I lost Joseph, but I'll um, do my best. If you have any questions about what we're discussing, please post uh, or, or in the discussion. Uh, Joseph is watching the discussion, so he'll do his best to ask or answer if, if he knows um, what you're asking. So let's continue forward. I think we left off in verse 4, so I'll read that again and move into verse 5. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it, is not, it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Okay, so in verse 5, he says... It's not just that you want to avoid getting a speeding ticket, right? That's, that's one reason to not speed. But there's another reason to submit to the government, and that's you have a conscience. Uh, 1 Peter, again, it says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they would speak evil of you as evildoers, they may, by your good deeds which they will behold... Glorify your Father which is in heaven. That, that, that is through your good works that you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Right? So, so there are those who will accuse Christians of various things. And Peter says, here's how you put them to silence. Keep the law. Do what's right. So, so not just because you want to avoid getting in trouble... You should do what's right also because it's the right thing to do. And as we're seeing, that when you submit to the government, you are also submitting ultimately to divine, to God's authority. All right, verse 6. I am going to have to speed up a little bit. I think uh, we're not on pace to get through verse, chapter 14. Uh for because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Uh, taxes. This is kind of a fun one. Oh, what? Do you see that question? I can't read it. It's too small. Abigail, she wants to know if there's any verses that can be used when like, the authority is doing things that are unbiblical. Is there any verses in the Bible that we could use for mm -hmm. that situation? Yes. Uh, and so the question is, if authorities are doing something unbiblical, then what, what do we do? Uh, the answer is, we still submit, because there are many examples, like David, or Daniel, or Jesus, or Paul, or Peter, where the authority was doing something unbiblical, and they continued to submit and honor those authorities. Now, the, the situation where the, the, two, the, the two issues meet is when the authority is telling you to do something that is against what God has told you to do. And it's in those situations where, if necessary, you have to obey God over man. Uh, we're, we're not going to take a lot of time to do a full study, but there, there are many examples throughout history where God's people disobeyed a worldly or an ungodly authority and... Uh, did that righteously. And so whether it was the, the Hebrew midwives uh, choosing not to throw babies into the river when Moses was born, uh, that was disobeying the, the Pharaoh, right? But God honored that. Um, or if it's uh, Moses defying Pharaoh later, or Daniel and his friends appealing to um, Nebuchadnezzar, about the, the foods that they were being told to eat. Um, the, the list goes on and on and on. But, you know, obviously the prophets oftentimes, like Elijah defying Ahab, uh, that there are many examples. One thing you'll notice is within these examples, you get into the New Testament church when they're being told by, uh, they're, they were threatened by the, the Jewish leaders, 
And they specifically answered with this, and this is the most clear statement on it. They said, we must obey God over man. So that's the short answer to that question. But what you'll notice in every one of these biblical examples, it was not an issue of convenience. They didn't disobey their government authorities because it was more convenient for them. The, the time it was justified for them to disobey government authorities was when it was an issue of clear conviction that God told them to do this and the government authority told them to do this. And in those situations, when there's clear conviction, we obey God over man. And so what you see in those situations, in, uh, in each of the ones that I've listed, the, the people of God who disobeyed authorities because of convictions about what God had told them to do that was contrary to what the government authorities told them to do, they were risking their lives in each of those situations. And you can go back and study them. It was never actually convenient for them to disobey the authority. It was actually quite inconvenient uh, and uh, actually quite risky because each of them could have died as a result of their disobedience. So uh, we, we refer to that as civil disobedience when you have a conviction that goes against what the government's requiring. Uh, and so there is an appropriate and biblical way of doing that. Um, but that is the exception to the rule. Uh, again, when you're, when you're talking about a paradox where these two ideas conflict, uh, we, we need to understand both. So understand what your convictions are, what God's called you to do, and also understand God's authority that he places in uh, our, our human leaders. And we keep both. Uh, one, one famous example of that is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, he was a German theologian and Bible teacher. Uh, who was alive during World War II, and he really wrestled with this because he was trying to hold on to both. And, uh, and in his situation, uh, he ended up deciding to go against Hitler uh, and actually participated in an attempt to kill Hitler, uh, which did not succeed, and Bonhoeffer ended up losing his life in a concentration camp as a result. Um, and so, anyway, there, there are all sorts of scenarios that we could come up with uh, for the most part in our lives, the, the simple answer is submit to the government, um, be a law-abiding citizen, and for the most part, that is going to be the instruction we stick to. When we do find ourselves in that kind of position, which may happen in our lives, then yes, we obey God over man. All right. So... Uh, that's in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 5 when the apostles said that to the Sanhedrin about obeying God over man. All right, Abby, I hope that answers your question. If, uh, if that isn't clear enough, then ask again. And let's keep moving. Where were we? We were in uh, verse 6. Um, uh for because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right. So um, there are some who don't pay taxes because they disagree with how the government's going to spend it. That is not a biblical argument. Um, the government at Jesus' time and at Paul's time, they were a bunch of wicked people who wasted a bunch of money and spent it on all sorts of horrible things, including killing Christians. Uh, and, and that was not an excuse from paying taxes. Jesus was, uh, the, the Pharisees actually came to him in Luke chapter 20, uh, saying, uh, they, they were trying to trick him actually, and so they, they were trying to get him in trouble, either he was gonna be in trouble with the people or in trouble with Rome. Uh, because their trick question was, well, should we pay taxes? And obviously the people didn't like the idea of paying taxes, and Rome didn't like the people the, or the idea of people not paying taxes, so Jesus was in a, a catch-22, and, and he very clearly uh, and actually brilliantly, the, the people trying to trap him stopped asking him questions after this because they realized that they couldn't. Uh, but he brilliantly exposed the, the flaw in their question because their question was forcing him into an either-or scenario, and it wasn't an either-or. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. It's, it's, it's both. So, um, 
if you hear people presenting that argument that we shouldn't pay taxes. Or another one that's similar, uh, actually when I was in Bible college, I remember I had to write a paper on, um, I believe it was civil disobedience. Something along those lines. Anyway, that same week, uh, I saw the front page uh, picture in the newspaper, and it was a picture of a church, I think it was Indianapolis, something temple. Anyway, it was a, it was a church in Indiana, Indiana uh, and the, the church was refusing to take out taxes, the, the, uh, to pay taxes on the salaries of the pastors, because they were arguing separation of church and state. Uh, the picture was a picture of the pastor being carried out of this church on the stretcher because he refused to move. And so the government actually ca came in and carried him out and off to jail. Uh, when that happened, I was writing that paper, so I actually called that church uh, as part of my research paper. And, uh, and, and they politely uh, put me on the phone with one, one of the pastors. It was a large church, and he answered all my questions. And it was, it was really disappointing. Uh, I, there, there are so many different ways that Scripture instructs us to submit to the government and to pay taxes, or the example of, of Jesus paying tax when you pull it out of a fish's mouth, and, and, and so on. The list goes on and on. Uh, and what they did was they argued context and Greek in every case. They said, well, no, the context of that was temple tax, not a government tax, and this was this, and this was that. And the Greek word here actually means this, and so we would apply it this way. And, and literally every time scripture addresses us submitting to the government and us paying taxes, they had a way to work around that and basically say they, uh, they were not under the government's authority and didn't have to pay taxes. Um, I don't think it's that confusing. So uh, if you're confused by that, please contact me because uh, I, I think the teaching here in Romans 13 and elsewhere in scripture is quite clear on this. So we should submit to the government and we should pay our taxes. And um, even if we dislike them or even if they're horrible people or even if they are demon possessed like Saul was, it doesn't excuse us from this. All right, where were we? Verse 7. So render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Right, so you guys get that. We should respect, honor the judge, right? We, we should um, pay the ones that we owe as far as taxes. Here, let me read um, Titus chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. So this is Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one. To be un uncontentious, gentle, Showing every consideration for all men. So, there you have it. There's a description of what we as Christians should behave like. Titus 3, verses 1 and 2. Uh, while we're over here, let's turn over a few pages to 1 Peter again. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 17, it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And then it goes into servants, be submissive to your masters, and so on, because Peter addresses not just the government authorities, but also in the workplace and also within the home in the next chapter, uh, and so on. So let's go back to Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Jesus, where did I go in my notes? Let's turn over to Matthew 22. We'll read this one. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Jesus teaches this. Be 
Because this, this, uh, this concept, when we're talking about the Christian life and what it looks like for us to live within society, uh, what it looks like for us to live within the body of Christ, what it looks like for us to handle conflict, uh, it boils it down to one thing, and Jesus actually did this for us as well. So uh, here's another time when the, the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus. So uh, Matthew 22, verse 34, will begin. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Jesus wasn't thrown off by this question at all. Uh, it's quite clear. The whole law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. If you do that, you've got it. And now, here in Romans 13, Paul says it this way. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And here he's going to explain it practically. This is what it looks like. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. All right, so this, this is simple. I love Joseph. I'm not going to steal his things. Yeah, amen. I love Joseph, I'm not going to gossip about him behind his back. Ooh, yeah. I love Joseph, I'm not going to murder him. You can relax. Praise God. Right? Does that make sense? It's just like I love my kids. And because I love my kids, there are things that I do for them and, and do to them. And there are things that I wouldn't do to them because I love them. And so the whole law is fulfilled in this. Uh, let's look at two other passages, if you want to write these down. Galatians 5.14 and James 2.8. Yeah. Galatians 5.14 says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement... You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is that clear enough? That's it. The whole law. Uh, let's go over to James. James 2, verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. All right. So here's the, the, the simple version. All of the things we face in life, all of the questions, all of the situations we find ourselves in, there's one simple filter. Love. That's it. And you fulfilled the whole law. Now, uh, I love looking at love as a filter because there are so many times in my life when I come into a difficult situation, Right? I, I have a, a, a situation with someone in a, in a housing and rental situation and, and there's a, a misunderstanding or a conflict and they're being kind of snotty about it. What do I do? Well, we can complicate these situations by looking at, well, here are my rights, here's what they owe me, here's what they should do, here's what I'm going to require. But what I've found is that when I step back from these types of situations and just look at it through this filter, it simplifies the situation for me and gives me very clear direction. What does it look like for me to love this person? And I fulfill the whole law. 
I can't tell you how many times, not just for myself, but with other people, they come and ask for advice, they're talking through a situation, they're frustrated with something. And the practical advice, and it's absolutely brilliant because it applies to everything, it's the whole law. But the practical advice comes down to this one word. What does it look like for you to love that person? Jesus said this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? It's a very simple, well, we call it the golden rule. Why? Because it, it just solves it. So many of the, the issues we face in life can be filtered out through this one word, and on the other side of that, we find clarity. Because the whole law and the prophets hang on these two things, love God and love your neighbor. Um, one, one thing, it says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Uh, it, it says that after taxes, but it says, you know, pay whom you owe taxes, customs, fear, honor. Uh, owe no one anything. Um, I do think that in the context of society, that Christians should be the kind of people that pay what they owe. Right? So I own nothing to owe no one anything doesn't mean that you can't have a mortgage on your house. What it means is you should be the kind of person that pays your debts. So it, you shouldn't walk through town and have to avoid different people and not look people in the eye because you know that you didn't pay them back. No, no. Owe no one anything. Pay your debts. Do what's right in the sight of all men. That's in Romans 12. All right, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Wake up. Right? It's not, it's not time to be slacking off. It's not time to just sink down into a rut. And I know a lot of us are sitting at home for a lot of hours. Now is the time. Get up. Do what God's calling you to do. So I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but Paul wrote this a long time ago. It applies right now. Wake up. Now is not the time for sleep. Our salvation is now nearer than when it was then. Let's look at two, uh, two uh, verses. Ephesians 5.11. Actually, we'll just stick with Ephesians. And Ephesians 5.11. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. And then let's turn over to chapter 6. And I'll read verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So now is not the time to slack off. Now is not the time to sink into a, a rut especially in a season like this when the world is desperate. Now is the time to stand up. 
now is the time to be at work. Now is the time to run the race with perseverance. So, therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Do you get that? This is very practical. Right? And so was what we read in Ephesians. It's very practical in our lives. Lay aside those weights, those, those things that are, are holding us back, and run, according to Hebrews 11 or 12. Run! Verse 13, Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. But, okay, you see the negative there. It says, don't behave this way because it's daytime, it's light out. But, do this. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. All right, we, we read Ephesians 6. Put it on. I don't care what's going on in your life right now. It's time to move on. Whatever weights, whatever sin might be entangling you, put those things off. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on that armor and stand firm. This last verse, verse 14, I find to be uh, extremely practical because it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Some of you have heard me talk about this because uh, in, in counseling students and talking through situations, oftentimes we'll pray and spiritualize situations when the answer in large part is very practical. It says, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So what does that mean? It, it means look at, so, so what we see in scripture is the instruction to put aside, to lay off those things that entangle us and to run. So making no provision for the flesh might mean, so let's say alcohol is entangling you. Well, don't schedule the hang out at the bar with your friends. Why? Because that would be making provision for your flesh in that way. So if you're an alcoholic and you're going to go for a walk, don't plan to walk down the street where the liquor store is because you know that's making provision. If you struggle with looking at things on the internet that you shouldn't, well, get off the internet. Turn off your computer or put some kind of filter or get rid of that phone. I remember several years ago I was talking to a, a student who confessed that they were struggling with some of that on their phone. And, uh, and I gave them some advice. Actually, we looked at this verse and I said, so what can we do to not make provision for the flesh? And I was so impressed uh, that same day, he went and threw away his smartphone and got a flip phone. And for several years, used a flip phone. Why? It just wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the destruction, the shame, the frustration, the disappointment that was coming in his life as a result of having that phone, having access to those things. And so he just got rid of it. So, we have to be, like this passage says, wake up. It's not time to be stuck there. It's not time to be in that rut. Whatever is necessary, and I'm, not, I, I, I'm talking for me and for you, look at our lives right now. If there's some way where I'm making provision for the flesh to entangle me back here so I'm not able to run, stop. Put it off and be practical. It says make no provision for the flesh. Stop making provision for it. So look at your life. If there's a way that you're providing for it, if you're putting yourself in position, like let's say it's gossip and you keep falling into that and you know that there's a certain setting or a certain group where you fall into that, well, cut that off. It's just not worth it. 
the destruction that we experience in our own lives, in our walk with God, and the shame that we carry as a result of those types of things, it's just not worth it. So put those things off and make no provision for the flesh and put on Jesus Christ and walk in the light. All right. We're going to ignore the chapter break um, because I, I love, again, if we ignore these chapter breaks, you'll see this flow of ideas that sometimes you miss when you study a chapter at a time. I love how this flows because Paul has just been saying, put away all these deeds of wickedness and unrighteousness and, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And I think of practical things for myself where I've cut off those types of opportunities. But the temptation is to then think of practical things for Joseph, where he needs to cut off those opportunities. Right? But what did Joseph do? Well, some of you have heard his testimony. He was struggling, wasting time on video games. And that's not what God had for Joseph. He was a man with a wife and a kid on the way. He needed to get focused, right? Put off the deeds of darkness and run. So what did Joseph do? Goes to the dumpster and throws away his video game console. Now, a temptation in this is not just to share, because Joseph then comes to school and shares that in his devotion, his testimony of what God had convicted him of and how he'd taken action on that, and we all celebrated Joseph. But the temptation is then to take that personal conviction and start judging everyone else. Now, if you and your free time are playing a video game, you're a sinner. Why? Well, because God, judged, uh, God convicted Joseph and he threw away his video game console. So now Joseph goes to youth group and every one of them is covered in shame and guilt because why they all play video games. <laughs> I, I, I love the way that, again, if you ignore the chapter breaks, you'll see this flow of ideas because what Paul gets into next is these types of debatable issues because God works with you and he works with me as individuals. And he might put a conviction on you or give you a command or a direction that might look very different from what he's given to me. And the temptation within the body of Christ is for us to spend all of our time criticizing and judging each other, right? Because that person's too legalistic and they're overly rigid and, and, and uh, uptight. Oh, and that person, well, they're too liberal and they're sinners and look at that, they're so worldly. Right? Because I'm, I'm right in the middle. I've got it all together. I've got it balanced because I've got it figured out. What we're going to see in Romans 14 is going to help us resolve these debatable types of issues. The church, sadly, is full of conflict. not what God intended. Jesus, when he prayed for the church, let's look at this in John. Um, let me grab this. John chapter 17. I'll, uh, I'll begin with this as we get into this chapter. Verse, John 17, verses 20 through 23. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for all those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me, and that the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them, even as thou didst love me.
Let's turn back uh, to John 13. It's a, a well-known passage as well. Uh, verses 34 and 35. It says, verses 34 and 35 of John 13. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you, uh, actually, I missed verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So we see this instruction from Jesus to his disciples. This is how they're going to know. Because of our love for one another. And then you see Jesus' prayer to the Father in chapter 17. And he says, God, let the world know because of their unity, because their love for one another, because God is love and God is in him and he is in us. And love and unity. So this is Jesus' intention for his body. And yet, when we look at the church, so often that's not our experience. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that the reason is you, not them. The reason is me. And so as I recognize that, my response should not be to judge them because that's only furthering the problem. My response should be to love them. All right, so let's get into chapter 14. So, um, just to give us some context, remember who Paul is writing to, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles as one church within Rome. But there was some division there. And so throughout this letter, he's addressing both groups uh, throughout. And so when we look at this conflict, uh, I, I think it's appropriate for us to look at this through the lens of some of the disagreements that may have happened between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so the two primary disagreements in, in this chapter that Paul is going to address one has to do with eating meats versus not eating meats, and the other has to do with celebrating certain days versus not celebrating certain days. So, let's get into it. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. All right, start off with this. Accept the one who is weak in faith, and, uh, and then we all think, well, yes, I'm the strong one. I'll accept the weak one. Paul starts off that way. But as we get into this, we'll realize that it's actually a particular group of people that he was referring to as the weaker one. But he's telling us who might be in the position of the strong to accept the one who is weak, but not for the purpose of arguing, not for the purpose of proving them wrong. Because my role in the body is not to be their judge or to prove them wrong. My role is to be one, as God is one. And my role is to love them. So, the temptation here is, well, I, uh, I don't have a conviction against eating meat. Uh, in fact, those who restrict the eating of meat, according to Paul, they, they're teaching the doctrines of devils. Um, I do happen to have family members who are vegan. So, do I need to uh, go into, let's say this summer I'm going to a family reunion, should I go into that and accept them in relationship and be kind to them with the hope that I can then prove them wrong and help them to understand that they're believing the doctrine of devils and they're, they're restricting the eating of meat? Nope. We accept them as God accepted us without, without any kind of um, holding on to this position that I'm going to then overcome them with. 
All right, so let's, let's look at the word, uh, this, this next verse, to help us understand what he's saying. Now, accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that, faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. All right, so here's Joseph over here with his green drink. Drinking my, uh, my suja green. Actually, on this one, I do eat meat, but depending on if we're talking about being um, healthy, um, I, I don't eat at McDonald's because it's terrible. Um, I, would, I would say eating at McDonald's is comparable to smoking cigarettes. They're both going to cause you to die early. Uh, they're both terrible for your health. So... Um, I don't want to confuse this, but what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the situation that was happening back then in Rome that Paul was addressing, and the, the two conflicts that he uses to address is, is the, the vegetarians versus the, the carnivores, and then also those who were keeping certain days above other days, uh, and what we understand is that would be like the feast days and the Sabbath days, uh, as opposed to those Gentiles who weren't keeping those days. So, um, what I want you to keep in mind is these aren't just issues of opinion or preference. The issues that Paul brings up here were issues of conviction, right? They were, they were issues of faith. When he's talking about whether or not you can eat certain meats, well, to a Jew, to have bacon, like I had last night, Wanda made us dinner, and it was incredible, and it had bacon bits on it, and I did not have any conviction against doing that, right? I enjoyed eating that bacon, but I might be relating to a Christian who's a Jew, and they might be overwhelmed with conviction and shame if they were to have eaten that bacon, so Paul says that the one who is eating only vegetables is the weaker brother in this scenario because he's referring to faith and he's saying my faith is strong because I'm secure knowing that I am that 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 meat in itself doesn't change my standing with God that that meat isn't uh, good or evil it's just meat it's just flesh and so they are weaker in faith because their faith is going to struggle with that. So, the one who has faith may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. All right, so you would think that in this kind of situation, Paul would just say, he's right, he's wrong, everyone do it this way. Because um, <clears throat> that seems like the most direct line toward unity, and that's what we're aiming at is unity and love within the body. But that's not how he resolves this. Why? Well, because the church will never all think one way about all things. We're always going to have different perspectives on different issues. And what Paul is saying here is that within the body, the great command, the whole law is hanging on this, love. We love one another. And so, he says... The one with strong faith who looks at that meat and says, that looks good, let's have dinner. And the one who weak, has weak faith and looks at that meat and has this sense of guilt and shame and says, I, I can't eat that. We all love. So I should not look at him with contempt and think, oh, he just doesn't understand the gospel. Right? So I, I'm going to tell him the truth. I'm going to explain to him that he needs to eat this meat because that's the only way he's going to demonstrate to me that he's actually a true believer. Well, then this guy on the other side of the, the conflict is looking at me and saying, well, you're barely a Christian. I mean, look at you defiling yourself and dishonoring God with your worldly behavior. Right? Your God is your belly. Well, uh, Paul says to the one side, don't regard them with contempt. And he says to the other side, 
don't judge the one who eats the meat. And before we get into settling these issues, he clarifies something for us that should change our perspective on everyone around us. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. All right, so whose servant am I? I'm God's servant. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? It's not your place. So whose servant are you? You're God's servant. You don't, you're not my servant, so it's not my place to judge you. I, I think this is, is absolutely necessary that we shift our perspective when it comes to these kinds of debatable issues. And we recognize that I am not your boss. I am not your master. God is. And so for me to put myself in the place of God and become your judge is absolutely inappropriate. Not only is it inappropriate, it falls in line with the, the well, sin from the beginning. Remember the temptation of Eve in the garden. It, a key part of that sin was the pride of life that wanted to be like God. And we find in ourselves this, this impulse to want to be like God and to place ourselves in the position of judge over everyone around us. And so, depending on the issue, I'm looking at these people as being legalistic and narrow, and, and then I look over at these people as being worldly and liberal, and I, well, as the judge, I'm always, you know, perfect. The problem is, if every individual is holding to this perspective, if we do not have unity or love that Christ was praying for, in fact, we have quite the opposite. Verse 5. One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. All right, you should write that down. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. This sounds like a dangerous statement. It seems like Paul should just say, he's right, everyone do it that way. And Paul in this chapter does not give us that conclusion. He says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. It almost sounds, it does, it's not this, but it, some people might read this as, being kind of like in the time of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Absolutely not what Paul is saying here. But he says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Um, working at Alaska Bible Institute, I've gotten to see as we bring students from around the country from different denominations and churches, and we come together on this campus, uh, sometimes this has been a struggle. So, uh, let's take movies, for example. We, um, we let, uh, years ago, we used to have a pretty rigid rules on, uh, on how movies worked on campus. They had to go through one of two movie coordinators. Uh, and in order to watch a movie, you had to get it approved by one of those two. Uh, which created a big problem. Because two people don't see all movies alike. And what we found out was one of the movie coordinators was very strict. Uh, he actually would not approve of Disney movies because they had witchcraft in them. And he felt like that was bad for a Bible school campus. So no, no Disney movies on campus. Um, he also wouldn't approve of uh, Princess Bride because it had a bad word in it, which is my wife's favorite movie, but we couldn't watch it on campus. Um, but then the other movie coordinator, who was a bit more liberal in what he would have allowed, uh, the, the, the two were judging each other and running into conflict. Well, the one that wouldn't allow Disney movies 
and Princess Bride would allow his daughters to watch uh, these teen girl movies with like bikinis and stuff. Well, the other guy was offended by that. So here we are. We can't even get these two to agree, much less everybody on staff. And what I began to realize was as I went around to all the staff, uh, what seems like it could have been a simple thing to come up with a, a simple movie policy uh, became very complicated because to some, they were very offended if the Lord's name was taken in vain. So any TV show or movie where the Lord's name was taken in vain was automatically disapproved. For some, anything that involved witchcraft was automatically disapproved, including Disney. For some, any kind of sexual reference whatsoever was automatically disapproved. Uh, for others, they were okay with some, some, some level of crude humor. Uh, for some, violence was terrible, and for others, we would gather and watch MMA fights. Um, and so we were attempting to get everybody on the same page. And after years of struggling through that, I realized that what Romans 14 says, uh, Paul's response to the issue wasn't to just say, everyone do it this way. No, Paul's response to the issue was, everyone stop judging each other, stop condemning each other, stop despising each other. Your job is not to judge, your job is to love. Um... Usually when I have all the students in class, we'll discuss this and I'll, I'll actually write different TV shows and movies on the board and, and see who thinks that different ones are appropriate. So we'll have all these you know, more questionable ones over here and more uh, strict perspectives over here. And, um, and it's, it's always an entertaining exercise because we all are going to find ourselves drawing a line somewhere and say, I don't think this is appropriate for Christians to watch. Um, several years ago, uh, when Joseph was a first-year student, he was newly saved. And uh, you remember this story? Not save it. Oh, am I, you don't want me to tell this story? No, I do not want you to tell this story. <laughs> that is a shameful thing. I won't tell the story. <laughs> I do not want Joseph was a new believer, and he uh, thought watching a certain show... Uh, was okay, and then everybody in the class like gave him a look, including Macy, who he was already dating at the time. Um, uh, it was it was kind of humorous, um, but he just didn't know. He didn't think there was anything wrong with that show, except for everyone else in the class was looking at him like, "How could you dare watch that and call yourself a Christian?" Um, but that was a few years ago. Um, So I'll back up. About uh, eight or nine years ago, what, what actually helped us to move past this movie conflict was right here, Romans 14. I, uh, I went to uh, house to house to the staff members and I read this chapter. And as we continue through it, you'll see what I read to them. And as a result of the truths of Romans 14, we were able to move forward and be at peace with one another in regard to movies that we watch. Now, a key piece of that is what we're seeing already. It's, who are you to judge another man's servant? And the question would immediately be, but what if they watch? Who are you to judge another man's servant? But they might bring this on campus. They answer to God, and you answer to God. So, um, this, this applies in all sorts of areas. Uh, I find it, it interesting when you look at all the reasons why Christians are not loving each other and not in unity. Uh, and the list is, is extraordinary. Um, I, I know some Christians are very critical of dancing. Uh, and that was an issue here on ABI campus because we had some, uh, some older Christians who were very critical of dancing and we had some younger Christians who felt like it was an important thing to do. Um, and you get into scripture and they were pointing at David dancing and, and the others were pointing at the worldly activities like even some of the verses we just read. Um, you get into to dress codes. In, uh, in anyone that's part of a workplace, you have dress codes, or you go to a public school, you have dress codes. Uh, and here at ABI, we've had dress codes, and, and one of them is something along the lines of not to have 
clothing that's excessively tight. Um, it, it can be very difficult to judge that. Uh, I, I remember um, there was a young lady here who was talked to multiple times about her pants being too tight. And uh, she just didn't get it. And I still remember because the staff member who was really frustrated with her was convinced that she was doing this on purpose, right? And that she was just so sensual and that she was trying to lead other people astray. And well, then I met this young lady's family and realized that's just how they dress. And where she was from in the country, that was normal. Here in Homer, Alaska, and then on campus at Alaska Bible Institute, that wasn't how everyone was dressing. So when she walked in uh, wearing, the, they weren't yoga pants, but they were tighter pants, it, it just wasn't fitting. So, we, um, it's, it's one thing for us to have a dress code and enforce something. It's another thing within a religious environment to judge someone else and take God's place in judging their spiritual maturity. Um, for issues that, um, well, we could go on and on with issues. L let's continue forward in this chapter, and, and hopefully this will continue to make more sense. So I'll, I'll pick up in verse 5 where we left off and then keep going. One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats, eats so for the Lord, and give, he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat for the Lord, he does not eat, and gives thanks to God. All right, so some believers would have this strong conviction that the Sabbath uh, should be honored. I still remember I was... Uh, a kid and I was kicking a soccer ball around and I got yelled at by someone after church for running on the Sabbath um, which was confusing because Sabbath is actually Saturday and it was Sunday but it was the Lord's Day oh and then I got yelled at for running in God's house because it was a church hallway um, where was I going with that oh one day above another Paul takes what is a very serious issue, a very serious conviction, and says, stop judging each other. Be fully convinced in your own mind. If in your walk with God, God has not convicted you that you need to follow, um, well, if you look at the Old Testament commands about the Sabbath, I don't think anyone that I know that currently is rigid about the Sabbath day actually follows all of those commands. Uh, but... Let's say that they did, and that was their conviction. I should respect that and love them. And if I'm free not to follow those rules, well, they should respect me and love me because I answer to God and they answer to God, and God is able to make me stand in his presence, and God is able to make them stand in his presence. Joseph, are, are we making sense? Is this? It is. Um, now, one thing to be clear on, we're talking about questionable issues, uh, debatable issues. Um, we're not talking about clear biblical doctrine or commands. Uh, and so there, there are things that scripture is entirely clear on, like thou shalt not murder or thou shalt not commit adultery. That's, that's not a debatable issue. The issue is oftentimes we try to take all of our personal convictions and opinions and preferences and claim that they're clear commands, right? So uh, someone says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, therefore eating McDonald's is a sin. I think eating McDonald's is unhealthy. Um, I, I had a student tell me that the, the food in our kitchen was sinful because there was too much sugar in the, in the food, and sugar is of the devil. Um, and I love that student. But you understand that we can have these types of convictions about a long list of things. And if you have that conviction, well, then don't eat sugar. It's the same verse that people have used all my life. I've heard people say it's a sin to smoke cigarettes. Why? Well, because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the same argument. Does Scripture say that smoking tobacco is a sin? 
I haven't found it in there. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if I have the conviction that I shouldn't do that to my body and God has convicted me that that would be wrong, well then, it's a sin for me to do that. But if God has not convicted me in that regard, or God has not convicted me in regard to eating a McDonald's or too much sugar, well then I'm free. And in that regard, I'm the stronger brother, if, if that were the case. Well, in, in those regards, I'm the weaker brother because God has convicted me on those things. Is this making sense, stronger brother, weaker brother? The, the stronger brother in, Paul, in Paul's teaching here is the one with greater freedom, and the weaker brother is the one with greater restrictions. So um, this, this often leads to a discussion on inconsistency and, and like, you know, is there ultimate truth? Is, is there right and wrong? And yes, there is ultimate truth and there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. Uh, but we all serve our Father in heaven. Uh, I would say it like this. I might have a rule for Genevieve, my four-year-old, that she cannot play with knives. Why? Because I don't think it's safe, I don't think she's responsible enough, and I think she might hurt herself or someone else. At the same time, in the same house, with the same dad, I might not just allow Jude and Asher to play with knives, I might even buy them one and give it to them. And that might seem entirely inconsistent and unfair. And they might, Genevieve might say, well, why are they allowed to play with knives? That's not right. And she might come and tattle on them for playing with knives. No, I as the father recognize the difference between my children and I can see that it's okay for Jude to play with a knife and I'll give him one. And it's not okay for Genevieve to play with a knife. As we were talking about earlier, make no provision for the flesh at the end of chapter 13. It's okay for one to do this and for another, they might need far greater restriction. Why? Because of the weaknesses that they struggle with. So just as I might tell Jude he can do one thing and Evangeline she can't do the very same thing, our Heavenly Father oftentimes in our lives might give a conviction in this area for one and not convict another in the same exact area. And that's what Paul's addressing here. That there were some who were convicted about eating certain meats and others who did not share that conviction. There were some who said, we need to keep these religious holy days. And they had a strong conviction. And there were others that did not share that conviction. And Paul is saying, it's okay to disagree. It's okay not all to be on the same page. And so within the church, we so easily get caught up in wanting to prove who's right. Right? I want you all to be thinking the same way as me. So I'm going to prove all of my convictions and say, here's why you shouldn't eat at McDonald's and here's why you shouldn't smoke cigarettes and here's why you shouldn't watch these rated R movies and, and here's why, and I go on and on and on and on. It's just not my place. And it's not your place. All right, so again, we haven't eliminated the existence of sin or uh, a, a definite line between right and wrong. There are clear teachings in Scripture of what is right and what is wrong. What we're talking about in this chapter are things that are debatable. Verse 7, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself, if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Got that? You're the Lord's, I'm the Lord's. I'm not, you don't belong to me, right? God created you. I'm not God, and I'm not your judge, and you're not God, and you're not my judge. So, I'm the Lord's. If I'm looking at other people and struggling with that, what Paul is saying here is that person is not mine. That's the Lord's. And God is able to make that person stand, even if I disagree with some of their activities. So, again, Paul does, in his letters confront people for sinful activity. He's not saying that there's no room for addressing 
clear wrongs. What he's addressing here is these types of debatable issues. And what I'm wanting to clarify is that debatable issues oftentimes are the same issues that we think are convictions that apply to everyone. And we need to be very careful about that. Verse 9. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. This person should stop judging that person and this person should stop looking at contempt with that person. Why? Because we're the Lord's. Every knee is not going to bow to me. People aren't going to stand before me on judgment day. No, every knee will bow before God. He will judge. All right, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything is to be unclean, to him it is unclean. All right, so again, in the context of commands, a knife is not unclean in itself. But if Genevieve is not allowed to play with knives and she has that conviction because I told her not to, well, to her, it would be wrong to play with a knife, right? So if she sneaks into the kitchen and pulls a knife out of the drawer and looks both ways to make sure I'm not watching, right? That's sin. That's wrong. She's choosing to do what she shouldn't be doing. It's not wrong for Jude to play with a knife. So to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If God has convicted you not to do this activity, then don't do it. Here's the problem. If I say the, the Old Testament laws on eating meat or, or not eating bacon don't apply to us as Christians, so Christians should all eat bacon, and if Joseph won't eat bacon because he's stuck in the Old Testament law, well, I'm going to confront him, and I'm going to argue with him, and I'm going to, maybe I'll even invite him over to my house and slip some bacon into that hamburger. Why? Because then I'm going to convince him, see, you did it, you didn't die, you're okay. Understand this. It is not my place to change Joseph's convictions. Now, obviously, if Joseph comes to me and, and asks for some teaching on, on where we stand with the law, and I, I explain that to Joseph, that's appropriate. But my role is not to go through Homer and look at all the other denominations and other churches and judge each one of them for every place that we differ. So, do not put an obstacle or a stumbling block in your brother's way. This is what that looks like. If I know that eating certain types of meat is offensive to Joseph, then when I have Joseph over to my house, it would be absolutely wrong. It would be unloving for me to make that kind of meat as dinner. Just like uh, I remember in Bible college, there were some that had the conviction that playing with playing cards was uh, was evil because um, because they're used in witchcraft. Uh, and I didn't agree. Uh, playing cards to me is just playing cards. There was nothing that I wasn't getting demons on me by touching these playing cards. But when I found that out, we stopped playing with playing cards at that church because that was very offensive to some people. Does that make sense? If I were to continue bringing playing cards into that church and playing with them, knowing that other people were offended by that and it would cause a stumbling block, that would be wrong on my part. The issue here isn't whether or not playing cards are demonic. The issue is whether or not I love that other person more than I love playing with those cards. 
Now, this isn't to say that I've never played with playing cards again. It is to say that in regard to that relationship, I didn't push that on them. I didn't keep inviting them to come over to my house and play cards. Because I did not want to present a stumbling block for them. Verse 15. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. So remember we talked in, in chapter 13 how love is the great command and everything follows after that. that. That Jesus said the whole law hangs on these two things. So now when we come into the context of these debatable type of issues that oftentimes we think aren't so debatable because we're so convinced, Paul is saying, you be fully convinced in your own mind and you live that way and you be fully convinced in your own mind and stop judging each other, stop condemning each other, stop looking down on each other. Because the church will always have differences in perspective. As long as we're all busy judging each other, we won't ever fulfill what Christ intended as far as unity and love. So, you have the freedom to eat that kind of meat. But, if you choose to eat that kind of meat, you are essentially saying you love that piece of meat more than you love your Christian brother who's offended by that. That's what he says here in verse 15. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you, a good thing, be evil, uh, spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, so um, I've met some people who think that MMA is, uh, mixed martial arts, is a bad thing. Because it's excessively violent and it's just people hurting each other. Uh, I happen to enjoy watching MMA. And... Um, and so, within those relationships, I don't announce to them every time I'm watching MMA or how much I liked the fight the night before. I don't invite them over to my house when we're going to watch a fight. Why? Because that would be offensive to them. And because I love that person more than I love MMA, I'm not going to continue making that a stumbling block or an obstacle for them. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. And do not let what is a good thing for you be spoken of as evil. So, for you, eating at McDonald's may be a good thing. You may have complete liberty to do that. And eating lots of sugar and maybe even smoking cigarettes may be a good thing for you. And you have no conviction against it. But your friend has a conviction. It would be evil and unloving of you to continue pushing your conviction on them as if that was the only way they could be in right standing with God. Why? Well, because you're not their judge. You're not their master. God is. So stop judging. Where were we? Verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then... Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. So this is what Christ is aiming at. This is the type of unity and love that he desires for us to have within the church. And it won't happen as long as I and you are busy judging and condemning those around us. It will happen when we agree and understand that we as believers, as, as individuals and as denominations, will not all see things the same. And yet we can still love. That's the greater command. Um, let's look over here. Uh, let's do this. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, this is a, a letter that Paul wrote actually just 
probably months before, or maybe a year or two. It was during his third missionary journey, and he was in Ephesus, and he writes this letter over to Corinth. And we know that it wasn't long after that on his third missionary journey, he ends up in Corinth, and he writes the letter from Corinth to Rome. So, uh, so time-wise, these are, these are pretty close. And we're going to read a, a decent section out of this because it's Paul addressing a very similar issue. Uh, and what he does here is quite revealing to us about how we deal with these types of issues. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to read a significant amount of this, uh, actually all of chapter 8 and some of chapter 9 and 10 as well. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. I love the way he starts this off. You have knowledge, I have knowledge, and this is the problem in all of our debates. What? I think I'm right. That's the problem, and you think you're right. So we can't be one. We can't be unified. Why? Because of our knowledge. Well, here's what knowledge actually does. It, it, it puffs up. It, it causes you to be arrogant. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So knowledge isn't necessarily a problem. The problem is love is greater than knowledge. So, concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So Paul is saying, look, I understand. You all have your arguments. You have your case. You have your basis for what you're saying. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols... We know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no, uh, no God but one. Let's, um, let's understand what's going on here. Uh, let's say that there are some witches in Homer, and, and they're doing their witchcraft, and as part of their witchcraft, they're killing this, um, you know, squirrels. They're cutting them up, burning them over their fire, doing their witchcrafty stuff. And Joseph... Joseph is a, a stronger brother in this situation. I'm the weaker brother. Joseph goes to town, and, and because he's a student and he doesn't have a lot of money, he's going to save some money, and he says, Hey, you guys are all done with those squirrels, right? Like, you already killed them and burned them, and now they're cooked meat. They say, Yeah, yeah, you can have them for cheap. So they give Joseph all this pile of dead squirrels that have been cooked already for, like, a couple bucks. And Joseph comes back up to campus and says, Hey, guys, guess what? Everyone's welcome Come over to my house for dinner. Uh, I've, I've given this scenario in class uh, for years. And it's pretty humorous because pretty much everyone in the class, usually there are one or two exceptions, will say, absolutely not. I will not eat that meat. Why? Because demons, right? They, they're, they're, there were witches using that in their, their sacrifices. I, I want nothing to do with that. It's kind of like the way I feel about horror movies. Uh, there are these like demon possession type horror movies and honestly, I'm just not comfortable with them The last time I watched one was quite a few years ago And I, I literally when I got done watching that movie I took it out of my house and I put it in the car because it was a friend of mine that left, lent it to me And I went back and I went around my house and prayed over my house I walked through my house and cleansed my house and prayed and repented Because it just made me feel dirty. It made me feel guilty and I'll admit, I'm the weaker brother in this. Because, as Paul is saying, it's just a disc. So in regard to meat offered to idols, I would say that most of us would probably fall on the side of those who would not eat the meat offered to idols. Right? Yeah. Good. So some, some would, some wouldn't. Joseph, would you? I mean, really, if it was someone in Homer cooking, you know, like, not cooking, but like, Sacrificing, would you? What type of meat? Squirrels. Like, yeah, I don't really want squirrel, so no. I wouldn't want but to. you would eat meat that was used in, in witchcraft? Sacrifice to I mean, it's not idolatry. my first option, but, you know, if I'm sitting there starving to death, then, yeah. But, you know, we live in a society where I can go and get chicken breast, get meat. So I would probably <laughs> pass. I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable eating that. So, I understand what Paul is saying here, that... It's just meat. 
but I, would, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Um, so let's see what Paul says about this issue. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge. So Paul does answer the question. He says, is it wrong to eat that meat? No. But he's not done yet, because he will say it is wrong, uh, in a way. Wait for it. However, not all men have this knowledge. So they're, the weaker brother in this sense is the one that's ignorant. Um, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So there are some who, if Joseph got this idol worship meat and brought it to campus, uh, their conscience would be defiled by that. And I would put myself in that group. But food will not con commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care lest your liberty, this liberty of yours, somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So, Joseph, be careful. You have liberty to eat that meat. It's not a conviction to you. You don't feel like you've done anything wrong. You don't feel defiled by it. But you have to be careful, not for yourself, but for the weaker brother, which is me. So knowing that that could be a stumbling block to me, that if I participate in that, I would feel convicted. I would feel defiled. You need to be careful. Got it so far? Got it. Get it. Got it. Good. But take care lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple... Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, and the brother for whose sake Christ died. And thus, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Do you see how we, we got from, it's okay for you to eat that meat, but now you're sitting at this temple worship place eating meat and your Christian brother sees you. You see how we got from that was there, that, that meat is just meat to now you're offensive. You're, you're actually sinning against Christ because you're offending the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again that I might not cause my brother to stumble. So he's going to give further instruction here, so we're not done with this. But we understand the simple, the, the simple command is love. And so yes, you might have the liberty and the freedom to eat that meat. And yet because of the simple command, that one command that everything else hangs on, you run it through that filter and you realize in this situation, it would be unloving for me to eat that meat in front of this brother because that would cause them to stumble. Am I, verse, chapter 9, verse 1, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Right? Paul is basically saying he's free to do what he wants. He's going to say that even more. Uh, let's skip forward to chapter 9. Uh, uh, we'll skip down to verse 19. For, all, uh, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win more. Did you catch that? Remember in, uh, in Romans 14, he was saying, look, that person's not your servant, so stop judging them. Now Paul is saying, I see myself, yes, I'm free from all men, I'm not their servant, right? I serve God, and yet he says, I consider myself, I made myself to be a slave to all men. that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. And to those who are under the law, to, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without law as without law, though not being without law, of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all men, that by all means, that I may by all means save some. You understand what he's saying here. Paul has been crucified with Christ. He has died with Christ. He's put himself aside, and he's looking at the needs of everyone else. And this is the picture of love. This is what it means to love, right? That Jesus said that greater love has no one than this, than the one who lays down his life for his friend. And so in this regard, we are called to this higher calling where we lay aside our lives, where we consider ourselves as nothing, and we consider everyone else ahead of ourselves. And Paul goes as far as to say that he's become all things to, to all men. Verse 23. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run as, in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and I make it a slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others I might should, myself should be disqualified. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were under the... Um, I should stop there. You get this picture, right? The way that Paul looked at his life and looked at this race he was on, and he laid aside all of these weights, and, and then he went, lays aside all of his personal preferences and his own rights, and he says, I am going to run this race, I'm going to serve everyone. And he compares himself to being a soldier. He compares himself to be a runner in training. He compares himself to being a boxer. And he's not just, just boxing for the fun of it, beating the air. No, he has a purpose. He wants to win a prize. Let's, uh, let's jump forward to chapter 10. Uh, he's going to, in this chapter, come back to the idea of the meat offered to idols and, and, and complete that idea in some practical terms. So uh, let's pick up in verse 19 of chapter 10. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that, a thing, that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. Right? So remember earlier he said it's just meat. But now he's completing his instruction on this. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Right? So Paul feels great liberty, great freedom in his walk with God. And yet he recognizes that although all of these, these types of things are lawful for him, it's not profitable. It's not edifying to the body. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. You get it? The great command to love can be stated this way. Don't seek your own good, but your neighbor's good. That's what it looks like to love. And so in regard to meat offered to idols, if you don't have a conviction on that, well, then you have freedom to do that. So he's going to give some instruction because you're not alone. So although Joseph may have the freedom to do that, he is within a community of believers and he has to be considerate of the other. It's not just about his right or his freedoms that is lawful for him to do it. He has to consider how it affects the whole. So here's how Paul says to treat this situation. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. 
Got it? So he says, look, there's nothing wrong with meat offered to idols. You don't have to ask questions. It's all God's. And so you can just go buy that meat and eat it. But that's not all. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you wish to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. Right? So not only when you go to buy meat, but also if you're invited to someone's house, you don't have to ask them a bunch of questions just to make sure that it's not been offered to idols. Uh, this was a lot more common problem back then than it is now. Um, but if anyone should say to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another man's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jew or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So there we have it. Paul is taking a practical issue, this, this issue of meat offered to idols, and he says, look, if you don't have a conviction on that, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Just go eat meat. But because you understand that it's not all about you, right? It's about the people around you and that we, we look out for the people around us. That's what, that's what it looks like to love is we put them ahead of ourselves. Well, because we understand that, if we realize that we're in a situation where there's meat that's been offered to an idol and that, that's going to offend someone else. Paul just says, look, if they tell you that that's the situation, just don't eat it. Again, this, uh, this may seem complex, uh, but when we boil it down, it's a very simple command. Love. The whole law and the prophets. Remember earlier I said that we, we can run into all sorts of situations in life, and yet there's one simple filter, love. And when we run our situations through that, even in something as complex as this, because the issues he's dealing with over here in 1 Corinthians, and then the issues he's dealing with in Romans 14, with uh, the, the, the holy days, and then with uh, eating meats, those are serious issues. Right? Those are real convictions that people had. It wasn't just opinions and preferences. It was real conviction. And yet Paul is saying that the bottom line, the answer to the question boils down to this. Love. That's it. It's not that complicated. Your role in this is to love your brother, to love your sister, to love your neighbor. That's what the command is. That's the great command. So do that first. Okay, so let's go back to Romans chapter 14. I think we left off around verse 19, so I'll pick up there. So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Is this, is it, I, I, is this clear? We yeah, we can that. Take All right. So the issue here isn't that I have the right to do this or I, have the, I feel free to do this. All things are lawful for me in regard to these kinds of issues. The issue should be the first question. The great command is love. And so we, we tend to overcomplicate these issues and want to debate our side and, and defend what we see. No, if you know it's a stumbling block to the other person, then love them. I still remember in Bible college, one of my classmates uh, was talking about these liberal churches and the church that we went to in Bible college We all wore suits and ties to church and he was talking about these liberal modern churches where they were like seeker friendly and they, they wore jeans to church 
And he was just like, oh, it's so offensive. Uh, you know, so inappropriate. How can they call themselves a minister if they're you know, standing up in front of the body of Christ in that, in that casual attire? It's the Lord's Day, and we wear our Sunday best, especially when you're on the, on the, on the stage. When you're in the front, you got to be an example. And I was like, what? what, what? I, I had a really hard time wrapping my head around that mindset. Um, now I am a missionary and I travel and speak when, when I when visit home or visit churches. I, I speak at different churches. Uh, and it really isn't about legalism or preference or my conviction versus their conviction. It's actually quite simple. It's love. It's respect. And so when I go to another church, one of the things I do is I'll call either if I'm friends with the pastor or I'm friends with someone in that church, I'll contact them and say, hey, what's the normal attire at your church? And I still remember my friends saying, oh, I just wear shorts or whatever. I was like, well, no, no, no. What does is, what is your pastor wear when he's up in front? What is the church accustomed to seeing up there? Oh, yeah, well, he kind of dresses up a little. He wears a button-down shirt. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to be in front of that church, I'm going to dress in a way that's respectful, that's honoring toward them. So if I go to a church where they're very casual, I don't wear a tie. But if I go to a church where they dress up, it would be disrespectful and unloving on my part to go up there in a t-shirt and jeans, right? I hope you all get that. If you don't, call me because this, this shouldn't be that complicated. Um, the same with Kat. If we're traveling and we go to a church where they dress up and all the women wear dresses, my kids, my wife, we, we all dress appropriately. The boys will wear nicer slacks and then my daughters will wear nicer dresses. Uh, if we go to a church where they're really casual, well, then um, we're, we're less concerned about dressing in our Sunday best. There we go. Okay, so, verse 21. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have it as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith. Whatsoever is not from faith is sin. Okay, so Paul seems to have presented to us this situation where what's right for one is, is not okay for another. And that's true. Uh, just like with my kids, one might not be allowed to do certain things like playing with knives and another might be allowed, or, or some of my older kids might be allowed to watch certain movies with more action and fighting, and the younger ones, it might not be appropriate for them. You, you get what I'm saying. It's the same in our walk with God, that for, for oftentimes reasons beyond our understanding, God might give me a conviction that's different from the conviction he gives Joseph. And so often within the church, we make it our effort to force the other person into agreement with my convictions. When the great command, the first thing we should be doing is loving that person. When I look around the community and I see people that are more religious and rigid and what I would think of as legalistic, do I really think I'm going to help them to walk with God in a greater way by condemning them in my thoughts? by criticizing them and judging them. On the other side, when I see people who are watching movies that I would never watch, they call themselves Christians and they, they, uh, they're eating types of foods or maybe smoking cigarettes or you know whatever it is that I have a conviction about but they don't, do I really think that they're going to experience God's grace through my judgment and condemnation? Jesus Christ prayed this for his church. He wants us to be one. I want to go back and actually end where we began this chapter with John chapter 17. We know that Jesus had told his disciples, this is how they'll recognize you, by your love one for another. He had instructed them that. But later in John chapter 17, this is his prayer. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, 
but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou dost send me, and dost love them, even as thou dost love me. Let's pray. God, you know, we don't claim to have all the knowledge. We don't have, claim to have it all figured out. There are so many people that see things differently than I do, and yet, God, you've called me to love. You've called your body here to be one and to demonstrate your oneness and your unity and your love to the world around us. And God, we can't fix everything, but God, we ask that you would work in us, each one of us here today. God, work in us. Fill us with yourself. You, you are love. We ask that you would work that in, in us and that we would see with great clarity the people around us, the people that we're interacting with and, and, and those that we have disagreements with, that we have differences with, God, that, that we would see great clarity that they are yours. That we would love them without reservation. God, work that in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It's been good. I've enjoyed our study. Uh, we have one more week, and we'll be finishing up uh, Romans 15 and 16 next week. Uh, as far as your homework goes, do your homework. Take your class, uh, your test. Um, if you didn't take your test from last week, you're late. Um, I'll, I'll be posting next week's quiz on probably Sunday night or Monday. Uh, please take it before Wednesday's class. So, uh, I love you guys. I miss you all. Hope to see you again someday, maybe. Hopefully. Goodbye.